So in this presentation, we enter the last two categories of fallacies. Fortunately, this is a pretty small group, and I'm only going to present five total fallacies. We have three fallacies of presumption. These are the first three you see on the screen, begging the question, complex question, and false dichotomy. And then we will look at two fallacies of language. These are fallacies that have to do with the fact that language can be ambiguous, can have more than one meaning. And when that happens, it's very easy to be misunderstood. The two fallacies we have in this category are equivocation and amphiboly. And they're not very complicated. The names may look a little bit alien to us, but there's nothing that uh, isn't uh, easy to learn. And we'll look at those toward the end of this presentation. So let's get started with the fallacies of presumption. When we presume something, we're making an assumption. That doesn't mean that our assumption is legitimate. So in the fallacies of presumption, we're committing the same kind of error we're assuming our conclusion is true, or we're assuming our, our conclusion is supported by evidence when in fact it isn't. And so the fallacies of presumption do this in, in various different ways. The key thing to keep in mind is that in various senses, the fallacies of presumption aren't really legitimate arguments because they're not really presenting any legitimate evidence for a conclusion. They're assuming that the conclusion is true from the beginning. So they look like arguments, but they're not actual arguments. Let's take a look at some examples of the first uh, type of fallacy of presumption, which is begging the question. Now, the fallacy of begging the question is not really about questions. Rather, we beg the question when we assume a claim is true as evidence that the claim is true. So for example, uh, if I say, you should believe that my coffee cup is orange because my coffee cup is orange. Well, in that case, I am assuming my coffee cup is orange and I haven't actually presented any evidence for the conclusion except for the conclusion itself. So begging the question is kind of a disguised assertion without any evidence whatsoever. And we call it begging the question because when you make an argument like that, my coffee cup is orange because my coffee cup is orange, you're begging someone to ask the question, why should I think your coffee cup is orange? What's the evidence for that claim? So another way of referring to these kinds of arguments is that they are circular arguments. They end up where they start off, and so therefore they don't make really any progress towards the goal. They just assume the goal or the conclusion is true from the outset. So here are some examples of begging the question. For example, the United States is the most unique country in the world because there's no other country like it. Now, if you're not on your toes, this might sound like a really good argument, but in fact, it's no argument at all. Because when you say that something is unique, you're saying there's nothing else like it. So really, the premise that there's no other country like the United States and the conclusion that the United States is the most unique country are really saying exactly the same thing. So this example is identical to my orange coffee cup example. It's just that it's more disguised because we use synonyms rather than simply restating the conclusion exactly in the same way. If someone restated the conclusion exactly the same way in the premises, my coffee cup is orange because it's orange, circular arguments would be obvious and easy to detect. But because people use synonyms and disguise the circularity, it's often uh, the case that we're fooled by these circular arguments because we don't recognize that the premise and the conclusion are actually the same statement like we have in this particular example here. Here's another example. Paranormal is real because I have experienced what can only be described as paranormal activity. Well, that's not really an argument for paranormal activity. It's just restating that it's real in slightly different, uh, in a slightly different way. Evidence for paranormal activity, I'm not even sure what that would be, frankly, um, but merely because you claim to have an experience that you can only describe in that way isn't evidence for it. Here's another example. 
paranormal activity is real because I have experienced what can only be described as paranormal activity. So this person is saying, I believe paranormal activity is real because I believe paranormal activity is real. And when you interpret the argument in that way, the circularity becomes obvious. Um, and as in the previous example, uh, you can see that the premise and the conclusion are really pretty much the same statements, slightly disguised to seem more impressive. The next fallacy in our fallacies of presumption is the complex question, which is also known as the loaded question. Now, a complex question actually is a question, but it's not a legitimate question. A legitimate question is looking for information, as if I ask you, do you know what day it is today? Well, that implies that I don't know what day it is, and you could answer in any one of seven, seven different ways, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, etc. So that's a legitimate question. However, when I ask you something that looks like a question, but actually presupposes its own answer, then I'm asking a complex question. And it's called a loaded question also because it's loaded with its own answer from the start. And so, for example, if I ask you, have you stopped cheating on tests yet? Well, that's not really a question because I'm presuming that you cheat on tests. So this is another example of a fallacy of presumption. The question presumes its own answer. Uh, it's just a disguised question. Let's look at some other examples of this kind of thing. For example, did you spend all of the money you stole from me? This looks like a question. There's a question mark at the end. But of course, the very nature of the question presupposes that the person you're asking it of has stolen the money. Because if you answer this question, yes, then it implies that the person stole the money. And if they answer it, no, it still implies that they stole the money. They just haven't spent it all yet. So either way, the question presumes you stole the money. And so therefore, it's a complex question. It's not really asking, are you the person who stole the money? And a question like that, you can easily answer, no, I'm not. Rather, it presumes that you stole the money. And so you can't answer yes or no without implicating yourself. So clever people will often try to trap us by means of a complex question into making an admission we ordinarily may not want to make. So therefore, it's very important that we understand what's going on with a complex question and how to deal with them. Now, the reason why these are called complex questions is not because they're complicated. It's because they're combinations of two questions disguised as a single question. So they're not simple, they're complex. And so the question, are you still cheating on your taxes, is a complex question. It's two questions in one. Have you ever cheated on your taxes? Are you currently cheating on your taxes? And you put those together and the question sounds like this. Are you still cheating on your taxes? So if someone asks you a question like this, the way to respond is not to answer the question directly yes or no, because if you answer yes, you're admitting that you cheat. And if you answer no, you're admitting that you have cheated. So there's no way out unless you divide the question into its two component parts. So the correct answer to are you still cheating on your taxes is I do not, I have not ever cheated on my taxes, nor am I currently cheating on my taxes. So you have to divide the question, divide the complex question into its simple parts and answer the simple parts individually. That's really the only way to avoid uh, making an inadvertent admission of guilt. The fallacy of false dichotomy happens when someone is trying to manipulate us into uh, something that they would prefer that we accept or believe. They want us to accept a certain idea. So they present us with a false choice that the only two options we have are the idea or the choice that they prefer or some other option. And this other option is characterized as very unattractive, very negative, something that no rational person would choose. So the idea is you have these two choices. Mine is the only one that is reasonably acceptable, so you're going to go along with me. Now, the reason why this is a fallacy, of course, is that usually in the vast majority of cases, when someone presents us with two alternatives, usually more alternatives are possible.
but by framing the issue in this way, people can put psychological pressure on us to choose their preferred option. Let's see how this works in an example. So here are a few examples. Let's say I was a Republican and I wanted you to vote for a Republican and I'm willing to commit the fallacy of false dichotomy. Well, I might say either we elect a Republican president or the economy will collapse. The choice should be obvious. So this person is presenting us with a choice. They would prefer we elect a Republican president. They frame it as if the only other option is the economy collapsing, which of course no one would want. So therefore, we're kind of psychologically forced to their preferred option. Now, of course, there are other alternatives. We could elect uh, a Democrat and the economy may not collapse. We can, you know, there's many different options that, that are likely in this scenario. So these two choices, electing a Republican or the economy collapsing, are not the only choices available. If I were a Democrat and I wanted to commit this fallacy, I could do that as well. I could say, look, we have to elect a Democrat or Social Security and Medicare will go down the drain. And of course, you don't want that to occur. So uh, clearly, you're going to select my option of voting for a Democrat since the only alternative that I'm presenting to you is so negative. Now, I think one of the reasons why these work, of course, is that they are valid deductive arguments. In a way, you, you, you know, you're presented with two choices and one is eliminated, so the conclusion seems necessary. But just because they're valid doesn't mean they're sound. And they're sound because they're unsound in this case because the the option of either voting for a preferred candidate or some disaster is false. So valid arguments they are, sound arguments they're not. The last example here is uh, one that George W. Bush uh, said to the United Nations, uh, speaking to the representatives of the world, either you are with us or you're with the terrorists. And of course, no one wants to be associated with terrorists. And so that's putting pressure on these nations to go along with the United States and United States foreign policy. When, of course, there are other options available. You can disagree with the United States and its foreign policy and not be a terrorist. So there's other alternatives. But when you frame it in this way, it looks as though that's the only option you have. Go along with us. So we're going to shift now to the fallacies of ambiguity, and we only have two fallacies in this category. Initially, you might have a little bit of a challenge distinguishing them, but I think they are clearly different from each other, and a little bit of practice will help us to see how they are different. Fallacies of ambiguity are different than any of our previous groups of fallacies because they involve language and the main feature that language has, or at least one of its main features, which is that language can be ambiguous. It's very hard to be extremely precise in our expression. And oftentimes when we speak or write, what we say or what we write down can be interpreted in different ways by different people. And it's this fact of the ambiguity of language that causes certain typical kinds of fallacies to occur. The two fallacies we're going to be looking at in this category are equivocation and amphiboly. So let's start with equivocation first, and then I'll give you a couple of examples. The fallacy of equivocation occurs when we use a word in an argument in different ways. We use it in one sense in the premise and another sense in the conclusion. So the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises because we're not using the same terminology in exactly the same way. There are a lot of words in many languages that can mean many different things. Like in English, for example, take the word bank. Bank is a pretty common word, and it can be used to refer to the place where we store our money. But it could also be used to refer to the side of a river, like in a river bank. Or it can be used to refer to a kind of a shot where the ball bounces off some backboard, like a bank shot, for example, where there's an angle in the shot. So bank is a very, very ambiguous word and is prone to equivocation. So here's an example of, of, a, of a fallacy of equivocation using the word bank. My friend John said he was going to put his money in the bank, but I don't think that's a good idea because if you bury your money by the side of the river, it's likely it's going to float away. So there's an equivocation because in the premise, we use the word bank in one way, and then we draw a conclusion using the word bank in a different second sense. That's the fallacy of equivocation. The key here is that you have a single word interpreted in different ways. Let's look at some more examples.
So here are some examples. Dense objects tend to sink in water. Therefore, Michael ought to stay out of the water because he's incredibly dense. Now, the word dense is like the word bank. It can have multiple different meanings. Here in the premise, the word dense means something like heavy or has a lot of mass. And in the conclusion, the word dense appears also, but here it has a different meaning. When we say that Michael is incredibly dense, we mean perhaps that he's stubborn or that he takes a long time to learn things or something like that. So we're using the term in a completely different way and therefore this conclusion does not follow. It's a weak argument. We should try to borrow money from Bob the baker because he said he had a lot of dough. Now, of course, in the premise, when Bob says he has a lot of dough, since he's a baker, he probably has a lot of bread dough. We draw the conclusion that we can borrow money from him because we take the word dough to mean money, like in old-timey gangster talk. When people talk about having lots of dough, they talk about, they're talking about having lots of money. But clearly, the word dough is like dense and like bank. It's an ambiguous word, and therefore, we have committed another example of the fallacy of equivocation. The fallacy of amphiboly is also about ambiguity, but what's different in amphiboly is that it's not a particular word that we're using in two different senses, one way in the premise and one way in the conclusion, as we have with equivocation, but rather we have an entire sentence or an entire statement that can be interpreted in two completely different ways. And so therefore we draw the wrong conclusion because we don't know exactly what the statement means or we're taking it in one way when it was intended in a completely different way. Let's take a look at some examples. Here's an example of an amphiboly on a billboard promoting family. What your kids really want for dinner is you. Now, presumably what they intended to say is that what your kids really want is to be with you for dinner. But this entire phrase is ambiguous. It could also mean what your kids really want for dinner is you in the sense of they want to eat you for dinner. So this is an example of an amphiboly. The entire statement can be taken in more than one way. Now these are usually pretty funny as this example is, but it's also a problem because if you commit an amphiboly, it could have serious implications. Here's an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. Let's say that you're writing your will and you say, okay, you have two children, and you say, all right, I want, I want to divide my estate, and I want 10% to go to the one, and 90% to go to the other. But you don't specify which is the other and which is the one, and so of course you're going to cause a lot of problems because of the ambiguity of what you're saying. You haven't made it clear who gets 10% and who gets 90%, and so that can cause some real-world problems. Uh, let's look at a couple of other examples of some amphibolies that I've captured on the radio over uh, many years. So the first two of these are from radio ads, and the last one is a headline. So the first one says, I'm Joe McMortgage, the father of two small boys and a wife of 13 years. So this was an, an ad for a mortgage company, and this was the guy who owns the company introducing himself, and he introduces himself as the father of two small boys and a wife of 13 years. He's probably trying to say, I've been married for 13 years, and we have two small boys. But you could also interpret what he's saying is that as that he's Joe McMortgage, he's the father of two small boys, and he's also the father of a wife who's 13 years old. Or... It could be that he's uh, the father of two small boys and he's been a wife for 13 years. It's ambiguous in many different ways, so clearly it's an amphiboly. The next one is an example of the same kind of thing. At Vice Grip Mortgage, we specialize in bad credit. Now, what they're probably trying to say is that they specialize in finding loans for people who have bad credit. But it sounds like they're saying they specialize in giving bad credit, which of course is exactly the opposite message you want to send if you're a mortgage company. It's odd that both of these are from mortgage company ads, but so, so goes it. That's how it is. The last one is a headline from a newspaper, fake pot crisis in Washington, DC. All right, well, what's fake? Is the crisis fake or is the pot fake? Could be either one. So here again, we have a, a, a sentence that can be taken in two completely different ways. So that's clearly an example of an amphiboly. I'll leave you with one last example 
This is uh, from the world of politics, uh, from the presidential campaign of, uh, this would be 2012, actually, when Mitt Romney was running against Barack Obama, and Harry Reid, who was the uh, speaker, of, or was he the, he was the party leader for the Democrats in, in the House of Representatives, I believe, said about Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney needs to release his tax records to prove he has paid taxes because so far he hasn't. Now, this is a very clever thing to say because what is he actually saying? Is Harry Reid saying that Mitt Romney hasn't paid any taxes so far? Or is he saying that he hasn't released his tax returns so far? So you could take it in two obviously very different ways. And I think that oftentimes politicians do this on purpose. They say something that they intend to, they want to be interpreted as being extreme or to be intentionally misunderstood. And then if you call them on it, he could backpedal and say, no, I didn't say he's not paying any taxes. I'm just saying he hasn't released his tax returns. So it gives clever people a way to back out of things, but it also gives them a chance to say something and then, and then take it back uh, kind of secondhand. So these are some examples of real world, uh, real world cases in which amphibolies and equivocations occur. Now it's time for us to get some practice in. In 2012, Mitt Romney was the Republican candidate for president running against Barack Obama. Harry Reid, a Democrat, said the following, Mitt Romney needs to release his tax returns to prove that he has paid taxes because so far he hasn't. Now this is a very clever thing to do because he could be saying that Mitt Romney so far hasn't paid any taxes which is a pretty extreme thing to say, or he could be saying that Mitt Romney still hasn't released his tax returns. So those are two very different things. Now, why would a politician do this? Well, because if people take what he's saying as being extreme, he could always back off and say, oh, I didn't mean it that way. What I meant is he hasn't released his tax returns. So this is a, a, a way that if you're clever, you can float a more extreme idea. And then when people call you on it because it's obviously false, you can back off and say, no, I didn't intend what you, what, I didn't intend it in the way you're taking it. So uh, amphibolies can be used by clever people, but in that case, that just proves they're clever. It doesn't prove that the argument is a good one. And that's the end of our discussion of fallacies. We've covered quite a few. It may seem like we've covered a lot, but actually we pretty much just dipped into the most important, the most common fallacies. Some, some lists of fallacies that I've seen have hundreds and hundreds of fallacies. Um, and a lot of them are variations on, on larger themes. So I tried to pick the most common ones that happen all the time. Now it's time for us to practice. In the module, you will have some practice exercises on fallacies of presumption and language. And you should try to do those so that you master the fallacies. There's also going to be a uh, answer key, as I always provide, and a video lecture that accompanies the exercises where I go through them in more detail to help explain some of the nuances. So you should do those in conjunction, but do those after you've attempted to do the exercises for yourselves.